welcome you this morning to St. James Presbyterian Church, and we are very glad that you are here on this beautiful Sunday morning. I have several announcements for you this morning. First of all, I will be on vacation this coming week. If you need to get in touch with me, you can find my cell phone number in the bulletin. And because I'll be away this week, we're not going to be holding the Wednesday morning men's Bible study. We will resume that the following week. We are currently in the midst of a discussion of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Third, we have a peace vigil that will be held this Thursday, July 18th, 
at 5.30 p.m. at Sacred Heart, the Catholic Church just down the street, if you're interested in being a part of that service. We also have some missionary friends of this congregation, Bernie and Farsa Jana Risakota, Indonesian missionaries. They will be here this coming Friday from noon till 2 for a light lunch. If you are interested in being a part of that gathering, welcoming old friends who have been here before and spoken with this congregation, we invite you to sign up in the fellowship hall. The sign up is important for us because of the light lunch and needing to know the numbers. There will be an Undy Sunday next Sunday. You've probably noticed that in your bulletin. This is an event to try to get as many pairs of underwear as we possibly can to help the homeless folks here in our area. Uh, that's part of Project Homeless Connect, which is coming up at the end of this month. And finally, there will be a session meeting immediately following our worship today in the lounge, new location in the lounge, just today. Uh, we have one issue to discuss. Usually we take July off, but we're going to be uh, brief today, we hope, and we'll resume again with a full meeting in the Horizon Room in August. At this time, we invite you to still your minds, open your heart, and please do prepare yourself for a time of morning worship. Let us worship God. Thank you. And if you are able, and we will join together in the call to worship. Come, let us bow down in worship. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Our opening hymn is number 489 in the Presbyterian hymnal.
The Apostle John wrote, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In the strength of this assurance, let us confess our sins to God. Our lives are cluttered, Lord Jesus, by too many things and too much to do. We are driven by the need to succeed and distracted from your service. We have often lost our way. Forgive us, let us, like Mary, find the one thing that is needed and sit at your feet. Amen. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I would like to invite Dick and Kay Carr to come forward, and I invite you all to sing the hymn that's printed in our bulletin. Dick and Kay, in baptism you were joined to Christ and made members of his church. In the community of the people of God, you have learned of God's purpose for you and for all of creation. You have been nurtured at the table of our Lord and called to witness to the glory of Jesus Christ. So I invite invite you now to hear these words from Scripture. You are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called you out of darkness and into God's marvelous light. Now, as you publicly declare your faith, I ask you to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which you were baptized. Please state your purpose by answering these questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Do you trust in him? Do you intend to be his disciples, to obey his word, and to show his love? Do you? And will you be faithful members of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way? And will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? Will you? Let us pray. Gracious God, by water and the Spirit, you claimed us as your own. By cleansing us from sin and giving us new life. You made us members of your body, the church 
calling us to be your servants in the world. And now we ask that you might renew in these new members the covenant you made in their baptism, continuing the good work you have already begun in them. We ask that you would send them forth in the power of your spirit to love and to serve you with joy, to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Dick and Kay, we welcome you to this ministry. Please welcome our new members. After worship today, I've invited Dick and Kay to join me in the narthex. We hope that you will come through and shake their hand and offer them a a warm word of greeting and appreciation. Uh, We're so glad to have you with us. Thanks. Thanks for coming forward. I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. This is your spiritual worship. Will the ushers please come forward to collect this morning's offering?
We lean on the everlasting arms of your mercy, O God, and dwell in the hope of your grace fulfilled. Whatever good we do, we owe to your power within us. The work of our hands is a gift of your love. Nourish our endeavors with your sustaining spirit and accept our efforts as in Christ we seek to fulfill your all-encompassing will. Amen. Lord God, we wish to see Jesus. By your Spirit's power, give us eyes to see his glory. Through Christ we pray. Amen. The first lesson this morning is in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 11 to 16, and verses 27 to 30. It's on page 103 in the Pew Bible if you'd like to read along. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the shepherd, for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And at verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord.
Our second lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Luke. I invite you now to hear the Word of God. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came up to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. It's amazing, I think, all of the lessons that we pick up from home. Lessons both spoken and unspoken which shape our characters and shape the way that we view the world around us. As you know, some lessons are said and heard and demonstrated so often that they become a sort of mantra. Before long, we can begin to see them coming like a skilled boxer. When I was a child, one of the messages that I received probably as much as any other was the value of hard work. This message was spoken often, to be sure. It was also modeled by both of my parents who worked long hours and usually came home tired. And then, despite the demands of their professional lives, it was rare, as far as I could remember, to ever see them sitting and resting in the evenings. From time to time, my mom would read. Yes, books have always been one of the highlights of her life, one of her great loves. But I have to imagine that she always always viewed those times with a book in her hand as a luxury. And I think that she probably felt more than a twinge of guilt for not doing more to help out around the house in those moments when she did stop and catch her breath. Of the two of them, my dad was the one that always seemed a little more interested in TV. But he watched it only in short bursts, since both he and my mother loved to garden, and the house was always exceptionally clean. It's interesting, isn't it? The messages that we receive at home, the values that we internalize, the mantras that we hear over and over again and then pass on to yet another generation. For centuries, pastors have stood in pulpits all around the world with this particular gospel lesson in front of them, this passage about Martha and Mary in the Gospel of Luke And they've looked their congregations in the eye and they have asked this same simple question time and time again. Which of these two personalities really seems to resonate with you this morning? Martha or Mary? Martha who stays busy all day long keeping the house clean who is dutifully ticking the boxes on her to-do list, who can barely imagine what it looks like to stop and to take a break, to take a rest, who could hardly even imagine our modern notion of self-care. Martha, the preeminent keeper of cultural expectations. Or Mary, The one who does things that women don't often do, especially not in her day and age. Here she's presented as a rebel, one who sits at the foot of a man who is not her husband and listens to his teachings. 
Her sister, of course, is all the while working away, and Mary seems either unable or unwilling to pick up on all of the subtle cues that have been coming her way throughout the afternoon. The sound of the broom swishing back and forth, the quickened pace of her sister's feet as she was going around the various parts of the home, tidying up and straightening things so that they would look good for this teacher her intermittent huffs of exhaustion. And finally, the collection of a clean rag to wipe the sweat from her brow. Finally, Martha has had enough. If, if you're like me, you read a little bit more into this story and you can see other dynamics which were surely at stake for these two sisters for years. Surely we don't have the whole story here, do we? I imagine that Martha has been feeling this way about her sister Mary for a very long time. They've probably failed to see eye to eye for as long as they can remember. And that day, Martha confronts the situation head on. She has a respected person in the house. and She wants to bring him over to her side. So she throws down the sweat-stained rag. She walks right up to her sister, Mary. She interrupts Jesus, their guest. And she puts all of her familial and cultural cards down on the table. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. For Martha, this is a matter of fairness and responsibility. And in each of these ways, I'm right there with her. Standing beside Martha, the one who really seems to understand the value of hard work. That was a value in my house as well. But Jesus seems unimpressed. Martha, Martha, he says, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need for only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Martha, I imagine, is crushed, devastated. She turns away, exhausted and bitter and rebuked. For her, this has been a a very memorable day indeed, but for all of the wrong reasons. And in the aftermath of this exchange, we are left to ask why Jesus would choose sides with Martha, with Mary, rather. So what do you think? Do Jesus' words of rebuke lead any of us toward a a sort of soul-searching about our own values and our own mantras? And why is it, do you suppose, that Mary chose the better part. It's absolutely crucial if we are to look at this passage that we back up just a little bit in this gospel story. I know that I don't do this very often. Usually I tell stories all throughout the sermon and I rarely say, look over here at this part of the gospel because this explains this so well. But it's absolutely crucial today that we look back just a little bit in the Gospel of Luke and we see the story of the Good Samaritan. It all begins when Jesus is asked this question, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds in two parts. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. That's the first part. And the second part is that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. And in the process of telling us that story, he expands and expounds upon our definition of neighbor. And he makes it a whole lot more inclusive by including foreigners and enemies and even people with different religious understanding, people of different faiths. 
And then here, in this very next passage, Jesus reminds us of what it means to live in response to the other part of that great commandment. To honor and to love the Lord our God. This is yet another parable enacted, this story between these two sisters. In the end, Jesus explains that it's not finally about social conventions and cultural expectations, as bound as we all are to each of those things. These twin burdens, perhaps, of busyness and distraction. No, in the end, it's finally about making the time to see God, no matter how inconvenient the timing or the place in which that encounter is meant to be held. I have to admit that in my own life, this is a terribly, terribly challenging idea. Because I want to side with Martha. Because I want to be busy. Because I want to get things done. And because I am prone to getting impatient when silence settles in and then begins crying out, to be heard. And so how are we to respond? How are we to get the right balance between being and doing? Surely God blesses the doing the most, right? Recently, I was reading an article in the Christian Century about the ongoing tension which people in every generation have felt about contemplation and activism, being and doing. In the article, one scholar compares the two to breathing in and breathing out. Both are essential, he writes. We can't live without spiritual formation or breathing in. And neither can we live without Christian mission in the world or breathing out. To me, this all sounds once again like a reenactment of that great commandment. Mary, seated at Jesus' feet, attuned to her own spiritual formation, she was breathing in. And all the while, Mary was on a mission. Martha, rather, was on a mission. A common mission, to be sure, but one that clouded her mind with all of the distractions of life, the distractions which led her away from everything that could restore her soul. The result of this sort of breathing out is obvious. Burnout, resentment, bitterness, and anger. None of us can give forever. That much is certain, isn't it? And even if we could, that would mean that we finally had no need for a Savior, wouldn't it? So in our context, perhaps the message is this. If you are feeling depleted day in and day out, then maybe you don't need to start planning that next vacation to your favorite destination. Maybe what you need instead is a little time to yourself. To think about your own spiritual formation, time to pray and to be with God. Does that sound scary? Does it sound challenging? Does it sound like it even has a chance of succeeding. This drinking deeply from the well, this time to be more than you will do. That day, Martha was looking for an intervention. Jesus, correct my sister and tell her that she needs to help out. But what Jesus offered instead was a very disturbing sort of intervention. An intervention directed at the person who was asking the question and looking for his favor to begin with. Worry less, 
he said. Pray more. Yes, hard work is good. There's nothing wrong with that. It's like breathing out. But make sure that you've breathed in first. Because breathing in is good for the body. And it's good for the soul. Words from a good shepherd. May it be so, and all thanks be to God, both now and forever. Amen. Please stand and let us affirm our faith together. We all believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a simple and single spiritual being whom we call God, eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just and good, and the overflowing source of all good. We are justified freely or by grace through redemption in Jesus Christ, and therefore we cling to this foundation, which is firm forever, giving all glory to God, humbling ourselves and recognizing ourselves as we are, not claiming a thing for ourselves as our merits, and leaning and resting on the sole obedience of Christ crucified, which is ours when we believe in him. This is enough to cover all of our sins. Please remain standing and let us sing together. seated. As we prepare ourselves for a time of morning prayer, I offer one joy, which is found on the back of our bulletin. Flowers today given in honor and in celebration of the 25th wedding anniversaries for Dave and Pat Nelson. In addition to that, there is a prayer from the congregation for Trayvon Martin and his family that they might be hopeful that God's will is always peace and justice. Please bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. 
Dear God, much has been said and written in recent years about our busyness. For many professional types today, the claim we make that we are always busy is just another way of trying to assert our own self-worth. We are busy. Yes, look at how much we have to do. Look at how many people need our attention. Just look at what would happen if we were no longer in the picture. Just look and see what tasks would fall through the cracks. Think of all the jobs that would be left undone. Just imagine all the ministries which would remain unfulfilled. Surely this reliance on our busyness is modern, and yet it is also ancient. You may have even heard the saying, if you want something to get done, then pass it on to someone who is already busy. At first, it seems counterintuitive, but logic tells us that these are the types who will not want to let us down. And so we push. We push ourselves. We push our spouses and our children. We push our co-workers and our friends and other members of our shared communities. And in the end, we admit that we have even thought less of those who appear to be idle, those who take breaks, those who carve out time for leisure or for rest. Help us, Lord, to reorder our thinking. Remind us of the importance of solitude and challenge us to fully experience the joy of prayer. For it is at the feet of Jesus that we finally learn how to be in right relationship with you, our God. We pray silently. Finally, and together as the people of God, we offer the prayer that Christ taught us as printed in our bulletin. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand once again for the singing of our closing hymn.
please receive this blessing in your journeys here and there. May God direct you in your happiness and in your pleasure. May God bless you. In care, anxiety, or trouble, may God sustain you. In peril and in danger, may God protect you. May the grace of God be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us share signs of God's peace.